Uh, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Increment Podcast. Uh, today, we're joined by a special guest, and I'm sure he's going to laugh at me when I try and pronounce his name now, but we'll give it a go. So, we're joined by Bobby Olejnik. Not bad, close. not bad. Yeah. Not bad. Olejnik, but yeah. Olejnik. Ah, so yeah. it's a yeah, At least you got the letters in the right order. Most people uh, don't even get that right. So. It's only it's only because I've got it up on my screen. I was cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you just want to give a quick intro just about yourself, obviously where you've you've been your, your career um in as a professional goalkeeper and just sort of a few footy teams that you play for. Yeah, sure. So um thanks for having me. Um it's been a while since I've done a podcast. It's been a while. <laughs> a little bit nervous, not gonna lie. But um yeah, so I'm Bobby Olesnik. Um used to play football for about what 18 years professionally, something like that. And um like football's just been my whole life. Came to the UK when I was 16, um, kind of signed for Aston Villa when I was about 16, and then kind of just went from club to club to club. Uh, ended up retiring just at the beginning of COVID, just because I had enough of it, to be honest with you. And um, yeah, what, played over 400 games, um, like in all four divisions. And now I'm into coaching myself, similar to you. Um, I tend to do a lot of in-person stuff. I've got my own studio that I'm currently um, op- like opening up in Derby. And yeah, I'm looking to sort of take that and use all the experience I've got through football and sort of help clients essentially gain confidence in a gym. Yeah. So obviously you've always been sort of into fitness and that as well. It's pretty similar to myself. I grew up playing footy. I've played for like the New Saints in Wales, Chester, Southport. So I've played okay. at a, a, a decent level, not not quite your level. But what was that like then, like playing for Villa at, at the age of 16? Like what pressure, do you know what I mean? What, what was it? What was it like for you? I I didn't really realise how big football was in the UK. And I know that sounds a bit silly, but you mm. live in a country where skiing's the main thing. Oh, you know, right. people that people do football, but you know, name name an Austrian footballer, there's not that many. Mm. Um, you can maybe Hans Krankel for some of the older generation that listen, you know, that they'll be able to name them, but there's not really that many players that have ever made it. And so when I was actually younger, and this is a bit of a you know backstory to how I came to Aston Villa. When you're younger, kind of, you know, football agents, when you're starting to be okay, when you're like 15, 16, football agents start to talk to you. And I had this one football agent, kept messing about, kept messing about. And my dad kind of just said, why don't you just pick up the phone and call Aston Villa and see if they're actually interested? (laughs) Imagine doing that in this day and age. There's no way anyone would ever pick up, but somebody somehow picked up. It was me and my broken English. And I kind of just said, I've got this agent. He's telling me this. Are you actually interested? And kind of one thing led to another. And then I had a goalkeeping coach come out and, you know, look at me and kind of, I signed for Aston Villa. But it's honestly, it's the most craziest story. Because imagine trying to ring like Man United now and being like, "Uh, are you interested in signing me? Yeah. Never happened. Why Villa? (laughs) If you don't mind me asking. I have no idea, to be honest with you. Um, Villa was just... He was the guy that had connections. I think it was Villa, it was Blackburn Rovers, and it was somebody else. So there were a few clubs that sort of had half decent youth setups. Yeah. And I think Aston Villa and Blackburn and somebody else, they were kind of more interested in signing younger players, whereas, um, you know, Arsenal and so on, they weren't maybe as interested in that. I, yeah. I, I don't know, maybe it just wasn't good enough. Um, I suppose it worked knows? out for you, though, didn't it? The, the, oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a, yeah. Bit of a weird one as well, because my obviously my family is from Liverpool, so my dad's his brother and then his other brother one's a live pill my dad's everton and i'm the the, the younger one supports villa i, I don't know where right, he got okay. it from yeah right. so the, the villa like as a club obviously stands out to me a bit more than the usual person because yeah. he supports them so uh yeah it was just there it's just mad when i had a look yeah, yeah there are a few weird fancy prince william he supports villa oh does he yeah i think it's some really weird people support villa i've no <laughs> idea why but yeah yeah fair enough but yeah, what what was like the the training environment like there? I, I was like, was it like healthy competition? What was the discipline like? Like how many days and stuff was your training? So we were training four days a week. Yeah, we had what four days. We had half day on Monday where we had college in the morning and then training in the afternoon. Uh, mm. Wednesdays off, but that was generally all day college until you sort of become a pro. Mm. Um, but in terms of competition, it was really good. Um, it was just, we had, I think, the right amount of players, if that makes sense. Whereas yeah, now yeah. you look at sort of, you know, some of the squads and they've got like 50, 60 youth players Stats. and they're trying to load 40 of them out, 20 of them stay and so on. Whereas we kind of had 22, 23 players there or thereabouts. So um, from that standpoint, it was kind of, as I said, just the right amount. But we were lucky um, because it was sort of 2003, 2005. 
I was able to train next to the first team. So it wasn't sort of having, you know, like separate training grounds, or anything like that. It's like some of the clubs started to have. For us, it was very much everyone was in one environment. So you, you would see your first team players and, and so on. And it kind of took the edge off sort of seeing your, you know, the first team players. You kind of just sat with them and had a little chat. And, you know, it just made it the, the like it just made it more comfortable in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, That's okay, kind okay. of what it was like. But yeah, we had, what, four keepers at the time, um, three lads from Ireland, myself. And that was all we had. Whereas, as I said, now I think the competition is just much, much bigger. Yeah, no, definitely at the minute it's a different, different ball game in it. But literally, <laughs> yeah, I think and there's uh, so much more money in it as well. I think that's yeah. another problem. I think players get signed, and there's not as much um, interest in their well-being, like placed in, into their well-being. Yeah, I think yeah, there's some support there and so on, but it's kind of like a disposable. Like if you don't do it, we'll just sign somebody else because there's enough people out there. Whereas yeah. when I was kind of growing up, there wasn't maybe as much money. You know, players weren't on hundreds of thousands of pounds yeah. a week. I think, I think that is one an Pablo, issue. Yeah, massively. I think Juan Pablo Angel was was he was one of the highest paid players, and he was about thirty six grand a week. I mean, thirty six grand a week that's championship money now. That's players you've never heard of who are playing for some of the bigger clubs. That's average salaries for them now. Yeah. Whereas if you think that was the top scorer in the Premier League at the time, who was getting that kind of a contract, that broke the bank at Aston Villa, you know, two thousand and five or whatever. So it's it's just the amount of money there is now. It's yeah, I really feel for the young players sometimes because yeah. Imagine going to a club, getting 40, 50 grand a week, and then a League Two club wants to sign you. I know. I, I, no one's going to sign you on that money. It's it's mad, isn't it? Because you look at like Green was, and obviously he's took it the wrong way and, and used his sort of image and platform, obviously, in a bad way, and he's, yeah. he's paying the price for it now. So it yeah. goes with that, back to like, like that saying, I don't know, like great power comes, great responsibility if you've got, yeah, true, true. got the influence, you've got to use it right. And obviously a lot of young players coming through now, like Foden, he's not, he's yeah. obviously not being too bad, but it, it's very hard on their shoulders, the pressure they're under and, and stuff. But Absolutely. It, Again, and you obviously. get used to that lifestyle really quickly as well because you yeah. all of a sudden start earning loads of money and then all of a sudden no club will touch you because no one's ever going to expect you to go. You go to League One, League Two, you're getting 15, 1600 quid a week. That's sort of two grand. Maybe some players might be in a little bit more, mm-hmm. but you're not going to be getting 40 grand a week. And yeah. leaving Chelsea, Jamal Blackman, for example, like he's, I think he's just gone to Exeter or something like that. Like he's just gone from paying Premier League Championship on big money. I don't know what Exeter are going to pay him, but obviously... They're a fan, like, like they're a fan that run club. They mm. haven't got 40 grand a week. They haven't got the capacity <laughs> to pay. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, yeah, it's mad. Yeah, I, I know from uh, from Everton with the, with the wages anyway, we're, we're not, yeah. not the best with the, the, the wages. But it's so do you, st- do you still keep on like top of it? Then is it still like a passion for you to watch the football and, and stuff? Or are you more involved with the gym and stuff now? Like, yeah, like the bodybuilding scene? Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, um, you're going to laugh at this, but. I have not been interested in football for about 15 years. I was the like, same. I, I, I never watched it. I just played it. I, I did. I, I played it because it was a job. Because mm. I, you know what it's like when you grow up, there's nothing else. Like you either become a footballer because you do it from a very young age yeah, or yeah. you fall away. Like there's no in between. You can't mm. kind of half it and kind of make it and sort of make it. And then kind of, you either are fully invested in it where you, your decisions are made for you. Everything that happens in your life is based around football or you kind of just half ass it, you know, end up girls club, nightclubs yeah. and stuff and you don't make it. There's, there's no in between. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was just all football, football, football. Yeah. I didn't have a chance to think. I didn't have an opportunity to kind of go, do you know what? This is what I want to do. Or this is what I want to do. Or maybe that's, you know, something that interests me. For me, it was just like, you have to just play football. Yeah. And that was it. But I've had, like, I've had a good experience. I wouldn't change it, but, and I've learned a lot, but equally I'd maybe look back and say, if I had an opportunity to explore different avenues, I might have taken that route. If, if somebody gave me the opportunity again, I'd say, do you know what? I know what football's like. Let me try something else now. Yeah. That's kind of what I'd do if I was 16 again, uh, you know, in that sort of stage. Yeah, it would be good, wouldn't it? Like even at my age to, to go back now and, and know everything I did now to, to plan your life out. Because I was very much the same. I, I was sort of immersed in it. And you do, you have to dedicate your life to it, don't you? But Absolutely. I think at the time, what happened with was at Southport, we just won the league, the cup and everything, and then yeah. a, new, a new manager come in, scrapped the whole team, and after that, it sort of disheartened and, and lost a bit of confidence, and they just, just stopped playing. Uh, yeah. but, but thinking now, there probably was other teams around that I could have went to, but obviously yeah. 
I wouldn't change from from where I am now, from what I've learned, similar to yourself. But yeah, absolutely. I can guarantee you, if I hadn't played football, I'd be one of those kids that sits in front of the computer twenty four seven, and like with sweatpants on, and like honestly, that'd just be me. Like I, I just football has taught me so much. It's made me come out my shell massively. But yeah. I just, yeah, as I said, if I had the opportunity to do it again, I'm not sure I would. I would go back the same road. Yeah, I think that touches on a question I was going to bring up as well is about like the importance of like fitness and and um, exercise on mental health because as you said if you didn't play in in football teams and stuff you might have been more on the technology side of things but how do, how do you think sort of that it has an impact from being like health and fitness wise on your mental health as well because I think it's a big topic at the minute isn't it yeah I mean I think it's absolutely massive I think it's 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 one of the you know, I think driving factors because we're just come, becoming more lazy, more comfortable as a society. I think yeah. in general, there's there's a lot more that's kind of you know, I don't have to do anything. I can get my groceries delivered. I can get everything like just from the from my phone basically. And as we move less, I think that's starting to become you know, as I said, that's just personally you know from from, from personal experience. But no one's ever kind of come into my my training session, into my PT session, and left unhappy. I think exercise, no matter how light or how hard it is, everyone feels better doing exercise at the Definitely. end of it, 45 minutes. No one ever regrets doing it. Yeah, It's hard to get going. It's hard to get moving. But as soon as you've done it, you feel a million Definitely. dollars. And that's, it's, 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 as I said, it's the hardest thing to do, but it makes a massive difference for mental health, I think. Yeah. I feel so much better for it. I love the delay gratification side of it. Like, there's, there's no cheating. A good physique and a, a, a good habit is the, like, you've just got to do it. Where yeah. there is a lot, you know... Some people are brought up and they're already rich from birth. They've, they've been brought yeah. up into a wealthy family. Like in, in other aspects of life, they, they can just be given it, but it doesn't, yeah. you're not going to get given a, a strong strong body and, and hellfire. It's something yeah. you've got to you maintain. Absolutely. So you can't that, cheat that. You cannot cheat your, your physique. Just... And I, I think now, knowing that myself, going into like conversations with other people, I can sort of gather where the minds are just by looking at the physique. And, and yeah. how they look after themselves and, and the self care and their sort of personality around that before yeah. I even speak to them because it, it does translate in both aspects, doesn't it? I agree, a hundred percent agree. If you look at someone, you can generally tell, yeah, they're on it or they're not on it. Yeah, because that, that to me that kind of takes it back to oh, the word balance. I really, really dislike the word balance. <laughs> Where's really, life really, balance? <laughs> I just dislike it. There's no one ever got anywhere half ass in it. No. Not expecting you to live like a monk and and live like a professional sports person um, 24-7. I'm not expecting that. But it cannot be 50-50. You cannot do half of what you're trying to do. 80-20, yeah, I can kind of go with. Give yourself 20% mentally, have a little bit of a break, whatever, because if that makes you stick to it, then by all means. But I don't believe in balance. I I think it's the biggest myth. You know, you have to be balanced. Tell that Ronaldo, Messi, anyone, Federer say to them, oh, did you get here by being balanced? No, he didn't. And mm-hmm. like, that, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I'm pretty, because I think in like the corporate world, which I'm involved with as well, it, it's work-life balance at the minute, isn't it? So yeah. I think they're trying to like condense work and days and, and promote that. But again, yeah, it comes back to some people are just not capable of dealing with stress. And, and that's yeah. the people who, who do need to have a bit more balance. But it's not even like balance is, is as you say, 50 50, really. Like you, you're weighing the scales up, aren't you? The, the yeah. same, where it's never going to be like that. You're always going to be either 14 and 51, regardless. Yeah. You, you need to have, uh, and I, the way I like to do it is just whatever top five things I want to chase for and I want out of life and plan for. Yeah. So I'll, I'll pick the I'll pick the, the top three in that priority because if, if the other two was like so important to me they would have been in that top three and I'll focus on them yeah. and I'll forget about the other two so that's they always I... become distractions yeah the other things that are not important they become distractions to what you're actually trying to achieve and then you spread yourself too thinly and you're never really going to get there. and people yeah. are like oh well that's balance well it's not really because you're not doing anything you're just spinning your wheels without actually doing anything yeah feel this happening not getting there ultimately because it just feels like it's just going to take forever whereas if you invest all the effort into one thing get there and then kind of just maintain it and then make that side thing and then because that's become your habit and then you just focus on something else and you kind of jump from one to another that's Definitely. how i look at it anyway yeah. i think people forget about like sacrifices these days don't they like for me obviously i, I my journey and i lost a lot of weight and people see me out now going out and, and being social and stuff but I don't think I went out once or socialised when I was in that, that period of time to, to get yeah. to where I need to be because 
you know, I've obviously not been balanced with my food to get overweight and get there in the first place. So I can't expect to have a balance and oh, I'll have a cheat meal every once a week. And yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it's just not going to happen. You need to, happen, you yeah. need to have that counterbalance from 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 where yeah. you was before. So yeah, I, I agree, agree with that. Agree. Yeah, um, I, I've also done me bit of research and seen um, you'd also play for Peter Brennan. Was that probably your best highlight of the career, winning a trophy? And was it player of the, the year for them as well? Yeah, so to be honest with you, my best year, I would probably argue, was the year before that, because that's kind of what got me to the move. Like, mm. that's what got me to move. That's when Peter Brapat just me, obviously, you know, championship and all this sort of stuff. Playing at Wembley, obviously, is one of the big highlights. Everyone wants to play at Wembley. That's mm. that's one of the things. And obviously, winning the trophy and stuff, and like playing at Wembley, that's that's... That's obviously the, the that comes with being just at a club that's just got the financial means to sign better players. Yeah. But I would probably say the year before that, when I was at Torquay, broke you know try, uh, goal clean sheet records, team of the year, all this sort of stuff. That's what's then allowed me to do that. But it was really all the work that I'd put in before that. It was probably one of the very few years where I actually enjoyed playing football. It was one of the very few years I had a great coach, great goalkeeping coach, a great. You don't normally say that, but it, the sub keeper was actually so, um, in a weird way, like he was so encouraging, making sure yeah. that I do well, which I've never had, but I've kind of taken that on board um, throughout the later stages of my career. And it was, that was probably my best season. And, and that then allowed me to then go on and, and you know, sign for Peter and then sort of have a half decent, you know, run with them as well. Yeah. Fortunately, obviously got relegated in the championship, but I got to play in a championship. That's kind of, you know, that's yeah. always what something that I wanted to do. Yeah, definitely. It's a it's a massive achievement just looking at it, isn't it? On paper, so I couldn't imagine like what what he was feeling at the time. But yeah. did, you you had a few games for Austria as like a national team, didn't you? So what, I'll did, just yeah. that I'll just that compare to like playing for your your nationality than you know playing for a, a city team or you yeah. Know, is it? I mean, it was under twenty one, so we we kind of had a little bit of a success. Uh, we ended up getting into the qualifiers for the Euros. Um, mm. I think we finished second in our group, so we had to like play a qualifier against Finland, and they ended up going to the to the Euros. We didn't, but it was just nice to be involved in that. And yeah. I was one of the very first kind of two or three players who ended up actually leaving Austria um, and playing abroad because everybody else kind of stays in Austria because, as I said, it's not really a footballing country, mm. and it kind of kickstarted a few more players leaving um, Austria to then go and sign for other clubs uh, abroad. But it was me and a couple of other players, and it, it was enjoyable playing for. Austria but equally the frustration was uh, you, um, you you realize why Austria isn't a footballing nation yeah. because you start to see the issues or the the, the misunderstanding or the, the way people look at football in Austria as opposed to in countries where football is a lot more successful like yeah. I was treated better in terms of kit in terms of um, um, the way I was treated as a person the respect when I was under 16s than I was under 21s uh, playing for Austria like I was as an under 21, I was a senior professional then I was because obviously under 21s you play like it's an age group. So you end up being older anyway, like you get yeah, to yeah. 22 and stuff. <laughs> it's a bit like, the logic behind it. But anyway, like we were playing away. I remember playing away in Iceland and it was absolutely freezing. It was October, like minus four degrees. And I wasn't playing. I had a stinker again before, you know, whatever I wasn't playing. We were doing a warm up and we were playing at this tiny stadium where balls would go over the fence and all this sort of stuff. Right. So. I finished my warm up, started walking back into the dressing room to get changed because the game was about to kick off. It's, you, know, you end up walking in five minutes before the game finishes. The first team's going out, and you kind of quickly get changed and go and sit on the bench. Mm. And the kit man looks at me and he goes, Where are the balls? And I've gone, They're still outside. Like oh, some of them have gone over the fence. I think I even said to him, Some have gone, have, have gone over the fence. And he looks at me and he goes, You should be getting them in. And I was like, no, I'm not my mate's playing, what if he gets a red card in a minute and I'm somewhere in the fence trying to get a ball? Yeah. Like, what if he gets a red card? This is an international game, qualifying. Like, <laughs> this wasn't some kind of shitty friendly. And he looks at me and he goes, no, you should be collecting the balls. And I says, no, I'm not. Like, I'm getting ready for the game. Yeah. I need to be on the bench. That's your job to go outside. But he was kind of comfy, you know, having his cup of tea yeah, and yeah. stuff, like keeping warm and that. And the manager going, whoa, 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 what's this commotion? And the, the, the kit man told him, and I went, what if he gets injured? And the, the manager knew I was right, but because the kit man was his mate, he didn't want mm. to say anything. So he went, right, 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 okay. Okay, well, we'll get it sorted. We'll get it sorted. That was under 21s. That's the step before the professionals. professionals. They couldn't grasp that mindset. Whereas in the UK, at under 16s, the kit man would get the balls because it's yeah. in his job description. It's you get the balls. 
yes, some of the balls will go over, but the under 16s kit man would go and get the balls. We would get ready for the game. Mm. And this was the kind of the, the thinking and the differences between under 21s. And I kind of fell out of favor with that. Yeah. yeah because yeah. I was having that approach to things, whereas everyone in Austria was doing it their way. So I then kind of, you know, they were kind of like, well, that's not how we do things here. And kind of just yeah. started falling out of our favor with it. And yeah, that was it. I think if you're a professional, you're expected to, to be treated and, and warm up and train like a professional, don't you? So it's, it's different yeah. to see. But, but, but imagine the opposite. Imagine the keeper does get injured. It's minus four. What if he pulls a muscle? First goal kicking, he pulls a muscle. Yeah. And I'm somewhere over there not ready to, to, to play. Like I think that's worse than you know not getting the balls back. For oh, no, game. yeah. Definitely. It's, but then That I was get... just the attitude. That was just the mindset in Austria. And so was, did you yeah. say skiing was, is like their sport as if so if yeah, it was like a skiing yeah. tournament i'm pretty sure like whatever the equivalent to getting a ball was done straight yeah. away do you know what i mean oh absolutely oh, massively, <laughs> massively it's just it's just Different. as i said that's why no one's really made it in austria people just yeah, kind yeah. of stay in austria and play in austria and maybe make it to germany i think that that's the best way to, yeah to, for them to you do see a lot of people like coming over to the uk to to, to pursue the career if it is football or something you want to play don't you because of how big it is and, and even just the, the science behind it and the, the saying and you can get over here compared yeah. to other countries it's just on the next level really isn't it so oh. it's a no-brainer as under 16s we were getting two sets of kit like I was getting a kit for my first half and I was getting a kit for the second half I rang mm. my dad and I told him and I said dad I'm getting two sets of kit whereas yeah. a year before that I'd have a hole in my trousers and I'd have to ask the kit man to do it and he went now nah, get your mum to stitch it and yeah. then I'm turning up at an under 16s game against Southampton and there's two sets of kit my first game in pre-season and he was like that's what it should be. That's yeah, the yeah, standard. Yeah. And that's kind of what I mean. Just the differences in that level, let alone the football side of it. Yeah. So Everton's run through like sponsors. You probably you'll have your, your footy boots and that, won't you? You'll have oh. Everton already paid for. I've got a few friends who, who, are, who are boxers and obviously with them, it's a completely different thing. They have to sell their own tickets. They have to get their own sponsors and, and go through that themselves. But in, in like the football yeah. scene, it's, it's all done money, through the club, good. isn't it? And, it, it's mad how much you, you can get off them for, for just being a face of a team but exactly um, yeah I, I think um, it, it's it's massive over here to be fair I'm like yourself I don't really like to, to watch it as much just because I feel like over here there's a big stigma about like if your team loses you have to be unhappy as well and I'm like I, I couldn't let a footy team dictate how I feel and yeah I think uh, another like question I wanted to go in is, is is like that on happiness and you know I I think happiness is sort of like expectation versus reality and however high you paint an expectation and it comes um, back either below or or higher is is how happy you are or how sad you are and I think get your take on that what what's your sort of perception on what happiness is and, and whether you think we should be pursuing it because I, I think we should, shouldn't should be pursuing happiness it's just something that comes as a feeling we should be pursuing like meaning I think I think happiness to me is bound with our habits mm. if that makes sense so to me it's kind of what you kind of put in and the habits that create day to day, they will ultimately determine happiness. I don't think happiness is a switch that you can kind of just turn on and oh. all of a sudden you feel happy. You have control over your actions as to what people tell you. You have control over how you react to certain things as to situations that happen in your life. And, and a lot of it, some of it has to do with upbringing, but you can mm -hmm. unlearn everything. And this is kind of what I mean. Where to me, happiness is a thing that is linked to everyday habits. It's little yeah. things that you do to kind of get to ultimately, we're never going to be 100% when it's never going to be perfect, but you, you kind of, a driver cuts you up and I'm the worst for it. And you get upset by that. You, you can stop that. You can make a conscious effort to not let that upset yeah. you. And you go, oh, do you know what? He's probably whatever. And you start thinking about something else. And this is kind of what I mean, where, all the little things that happen in your day to day that they are your little habits they're the, the things that you've kind of learned throughout the years and as you get older you less of those things let you like affect you which therefore means you are more happy because you're not impacted by those things you kind of just go oh, whatever and you just laugh it off and you kind yeah, of just, yeah. just go with it that's kind of what i look as happiness i'm not expecting happiness to me anyway happiness isn't such a thing like you know, when somebody makes you laugh or anything like that, that to me isn't happiness. Happiness mm. just to me is like, you're just content. Just there's no me. worry. There's no discomfort. That's kind of, to me, what happiness means. Like there's yeah. just that normal day-to-day -day kind of a thing. I think maybe people just expect happiness to be, to make them too happy. Yeah. Like, too I, happy. I think they get it misconstrued now with like dopamine. 
happiness. Yes, that's, yes, yes. I exactly. think that that's the, the way people are looking at it. And there is so much dopamine going about now because you can yeah. just go on Instagram and get instant yeah. validation from any anything really. And you can exactly. scroll endlessly on TikTok. And I do feel for the younger society because, as you say, we're upbringing it, it's all these sorts of knowing. You know, social media is a great tool for like business and stuff like that to yeah. to outreach. It's never been look at with yourself where you've you've made one phone call and you've been in touch with a, a, a assistant or a manager yeah, filler yeah. and you, you've pursued a career that way. But if that was ten years earlier, there was no phones about that would never that opportunity oh, would that, never be there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So much we can't say social media is the, to blame because it, it's also to blame for a lot of good that's that's going on in the world but oh absolutely i yeah. think people need to learn and i think it needs to be a part of the skills how to, to manage and deal with social media and i think people need to be getting restrictions on on how much time and stuff they spend on certain apps yes they yes. need to be using it for the good that's yes. especially that's younger tip. especially when you're younger especially that's that's you know when you're when you're kids in school and stuff absolutely there's so much you know, as you said like social media is good in one sense you can definitely impact a lot of people but equally there's there's a lot of things that are you know i think there's more negative stuff with social media definitely 100 yeah. agree i think the brain has like its own algorithm as well isn't it so the more you promote one like and you're more like i don't watch the news because there's no it's all negative so yeah. the more like stuff like that you consume the more you're going to be absolutely yeah so, yeah. If there's something important that happens in your life, somebody will be there to tell you. Yeah, that's, that's how I look at it. If there was something <laughs> happening in life, somebody will come over to tell me. I don't care what the weather's like. I just look outside. Like, and yeah, you know, what it is. You know what I mean? It's like traffic, maybe, but that's you know, I've got yeah. output. The rest, kind of, if something's happening. Somebody will come over and tell me. Yeah, you, you'll know the petrol prices when you go to fill up, and you're like, well, yeah, exactly, yeah, you exactly. Don't need to, to look on exactly. that. Exactly. I don't want to keep you too long anyway, and I just as like a tradition for the podcast, I, I just do like what's one thing you'd advise to, to the younger generations, more my demographic, what they could do today to become the best version of themselves? I think I touched on this earlier about the happiness and stuff. To me, it is about habits. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's little things that are seemingly easy to do and easy mm. not to do. That to me is kind of what I would put my effort in. No change has ever come about from one big thing. Mm. And it's, a, it's a, maybe a stupid analysis, but like, you build a house one brick at a time and mm. that's kind of how I look at it and and, and if I could go back and do things differently my, in, when I was younger that's something that I would focus on yeah. I always expected this oh when I turn 20 this something's going to happen like like there's some magic switch that's going to you know some something's going to happen in my brain when I turn 20 or when I turn 30 this is going to happen yeah. it's it's to me it's focusing on the little things those everyday actions that nobody cares about that nobody that they're completely invisible or almost invisible that to me is something that, as I said, I wish I'd done when I was younger and focused on more because I let too many things kind of, I let my habits kind of build automatically by my mm. reactions, by not really being in control of it. Just like, oh, someone's cut me up and whatever, I'm just going to get angry with them. And, and, and kind of over time, that becomes a thing. And 10, 15 years later, you, got, you get angry at every little thing and you're going, I shouldn't get angry at those little things. And it's mm. those little things that get me there. That would have got me there, I think, if I'd just focused on them sooner. And that's that'd be my take to talking to people. And most people will probably look at it and go, What? Like no, I, I actions. Yeah. But to me, that's 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 all ultimately all it is. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think you know when people see like an overnight success, they don't see like the amount of time that's been going and yeah. put into it prior. They just see, oh yeah, one video or whatever it is that that's led to, to that overnight success is blew up. Yeah. But they don't understand the the hours they've put into it or the content yeah. they've been creating before and and as yeah, you say, yeah, yeah. You used a good analogy with like the bricks for the house. So I completely agree. But yeah, I thank thanks for your time anyway. And no, no, no problem at all. Absolute pleasure. Had a good chat. Um we definitely have to get a session in, in